1992, after a career in business working on energy issues, uh, he was uh, the lead of the task force for the Indian government in deciding on the country's strategy and negotiating the Montreal Protocol. And he's an expert on technology transfer and helping build UNEP's ozone action program. And finally, Ellen Roy, uh, who is a very uh, a friend both to me and to this, uh, uh, this school and to this center. She's a very knowledgeable outside observer, but she has done had a, a, a very her career is very impressive. She worked in business, uh, constructing and regulating power plants in the United States. She served as the Secretary of Environmental Affairs for Massachusetts. She is a former fellow here at the center, and she uh, was a lecturer at MIT Sloan School. Uh, the format uh, this afternoon is that I will begin by asking the panel questions, uh, hopefully uh, stimulating the dialogue, and then I will open the, the floor up to questions from, the, from all of you. So I'd like to start uh, by asking Amy, how did this, uh, how did Greenpeace decide to focus on fluorinated gases? What was the, uh, how did you convince uh, your board and your members that this was an issue that was worth putting a significant amount of, uh, of their um, uh, capital or their uh, into? Okay, is this on? Yes. Um, thanks for having us. Happy to be here. Um, Greenpeace, as you all see in front of you, has been working on F gases for 25 years. And we originally started working on it regarding CFCs, which were the predecessor chemicals to HFCs. CFCs, you, most of you probably remember, were creating a hole in the ozone, which uh, spurred the Montreal Protocol to ban them in the late 80s. We were part of the world cry to eliminate, to, to eliminate CFCs. And then in 1992, when CFCs were in fact banned, the chemical industry put forth HFCs as the environmental alternative. And HFCs, which are the current most common refrigeration chemical, are uh, as Henry said, many times more potent than CO2. And it was very clear that they were going to continue causing a huge greenhouse gas global warming problem. But in 1992, nobody in the world, or very few people in the world, had global warming on their radar. Global warming was some crazy thing that these crazy green pieces were talking about. And we were ridiculed terribly everywhere, we were called extremists. And the organization and our board and our senior management were very clear, we have to fight these chemicals, they will cause a huge global warming problem. And in 1995, when the IPCC measured the impact of F gases, that includes CFCs and HFCs, they were 17% of the world's global warming impact not emissions, but impact. And that goes back to the issue of global warming potential. So it was a fairly clear choice. Something that causes 17% of the world's global warming impact is something Greenpeace is going to address. But let me ask you, why did you decide to go with a partnership? Why not simply go up to the various uh, legislative bodies in Europe and the United States and demand to be regulated? Well, we did that too. <laughs> but, but you did it too, but you also did the part. Well, I'll tell you why. We, we began, the first area of refrigeration that we addressed was the domestic refrigerator, in some ways because it was the easiest. It wasn't easy, but it was certainly easier than the work we've done with these corporations. And I, I mean that in the best way. <laughs> I said came out wrong. Uh, in 1992, when HFCs were about to become the major chemical for domestic refrigerators, and as I said, Greenpeace was ridiculed horribly, we convened some engineers, came up with a better solution, went to a variety of corporations and say, don't use HFCs, use hydrocarbons. No, 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 don't worry about this global warming. And 
Greenpeace Germany then pre-sold 70,000 units of a non-existent refrigerator in three weeks, pre-internet. This was not a click and buy, this was a serious purchase. Then we went back to the manu manufacturer of the prototype and said, will you now manufacture? We have 70,000 orders. Well, obviously they said yes, and since then, Four to five hundred million of these refrigerators have been sold globally. You can see on the chart in front of you, that it's not in the United States, I'm sure we'll get to that later. But then, in 2000, during the Sydney Olympics, when Coca-Cola and McDonald's said they were sponsoring a Green Olympics, we disagreed. And we gave both of them a migraine headache. And um, to their credit, they came to the table. And it was very clear that corporations can move much more dynamically and dramatically and fundamentally than government. Because this was a global issue, it would take global policy to change it. So here we were at the table with two of the world's leading corporations. Well, actually Unilever joined very early on in the refrigerants naturally uh, spectrum or continuum. But it, the reason we're working with these corporations is that we have stayed at the table, they have stayed at the table for 10 years, and this fall we made a wholesale change in an entire sector through the Consumer Goods Forum, thanks to the leadership of these corporations here with, with us. So that's why, with results. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Jeff and David, uh, Greenpeace comes and uh, threatens you with migraine headaches. And you gave them, we didn't threaten. And, and, you, and you call up your, your, uh, uh, your board and say, boy, we've got a great idea. We're going to go partner, uh, set up a partnership and uh, work with Greenpeace. Uh, why did you do it? And how hard was it to sell internally? I'll just start, Jeff. I'll, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Well, uh, I think uh, we certainly did get a migraine in the year 2000. It was the Sydney Olympics. And I think it was in part because we were early adopters of the, of the Montreal Protocol. So we moved relatively quickly in um, phasing out CFCs, requiring a phase out of CFCs um, in new purchases for our system, uh, and, and sort of demonstrated that we were in the game, if you will, on refrigerant gas responsibility. As it became clear to Greenpeace that the, that the uh, HFC challenge was really a strategic issue in terms of climate change, and mounted, I think it was called Green Olympics Dirty Sponsors, if I'm not mistaken. It was, it was and they played with our Spencerian script and you know climate kills, and it was it was, it was brilliant. Yeah, it was great. Um, and and our CEO uh, at the time, um, you know, saw this happening and said, "Well, what's this about?" Brian Jacob, who's sitting in the front row here, uh, lived through that. I, I did not. I joined the company three years after that, but um, made the decision, I think to the surprise of Greenpeace, that rather than, than sort of hunkering down in, in, in a defensive crouch, uh, we wanted to meet and talk about what we could do to actually engage and, and address the challenge. Uh, and that began a process and a dialogue that led to a commitment on our part, led, announced by our CEO, uh, with uh, the support of, of Greenpeace, that we would uh, phase out of HFCs, and we had some language in there about where commercially viable, which you know was something we could talk about. Um, to make our refrigeration equipment 40% more efficient over the next decade, which we've now done, uh, and also to uh, get rid of uh, F gases in the insulation, the, 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 the insulation foam uh, in our refrigeration equipment. And we have some 10 million pieces of equipment you know, around, around the world in, in 200 countries, so it's a pretty big, pretty big footprint. Uh, and that, it was that moment in Sydney, I think, that really sort of brought us together, I think, to the disappointment of Greenpeace, because they were hoping to mount it would have been a great campaign. It would have been a great campaign. We kind of took the took the sting out a little bit. Um, but uh, and then as we as we got into it and we started really looking um, at the technology, at the options, and, and, and sort of the um, various um, uh, pathways to move to HFC free, uh, it became increasingly clear uh, that we alone, you know, could not could not surmount this challenge. This is a, a collaborative uh, issue that's going to require businesses working together. Um, but working with NGOs, working with government, uh, and so the, the idea of refrigerants naturally was really born out of necessity uh, that we needed a collaborative platform 
that could bring us together to get critical mass to begin to really uh, elevate the agenda, to get our suppliers engaged, uh, and to take the challenge to the, to the next level. And so I think that coming along in, in 2004 was, was really a seminal moment. David? Um, we didn't get a migraine. Uh, we got more sort of your run-of-the-mill sinus headache. Uh, I would say, uh, partially, uh, partially because Unilever as a company in 2000 uh, was not terribly well known by its corporate name, unlike uh, Coca-Cola, McDonald's, or Pepsi, where the company name is the product. That was not the case with us. So um, we didn't quite get, get the headache. We kind of came to this in a, in a slight, from a slightly different perspective. Uh, Unilever has been around since 1888 or so, uh, the modern corporation since 1930, and the heritage of the company has always been to put a high premium on sustainability as a company. Now, what we me meant by sustainability when the company was founded and what we mean by it today uh, are not the same things. Um, and maybe perhaps later on we talk a little bit about what some of those differences are. But where we were in 2000, um, as a result of, of the uh, initiative the Green Peace took, was, was to, to have what we in business we would sometimes call an aha moment, where all of a sudden we realized uh, in the, in the you know, uh, not get this quite right, uh, but the classic Pogo cartoon, Pogo, you know, Pogo looks looks in the mirror and says, "We have found the enemy, and it is us." Um, we all of a sudden looked in the mirror and realized that that what we we were doing as a company was contributing <clears throat> to greenhouse gases uh, in a way that was really not consistent with with the way we'd like to try to run our business, and that's how we came to part basically. Um, since then, our notion of sustainability has changed somewhat. But um, we have always been a company that likes to think of ourselves as, as one that uh, doesn't um, hold grudges or uh, refuse to talk to people because of their their particular views um, that may disagree with ours. And so it was not unusual or unnatural for us uh, to reach out to, to Greenpeace after sitting and, and talking about this. Let me ask, uh, you meet with Greenpeace, uh, you uh, uh, make a decision that you want to join this part, you want to do this, mm -hmm. but you don't make refrigerators or coolers or, uh, uh, or vending machines. You got to go to the Bosch's of the world and the GE's of the world and say, you know, we think you should change your product line. What happened when you originally had those conversations? Did they have a, a uh, oh my gosh, we ought to quickly uh, invest and change our uh, lines, or was there some resistance? Well, I don't know that I would use the word resistance to describe it. Um, any, any company generally wants to be as responsive to its customers as they can possibly be. So, um, we didn't get resistance per se. There, there are, however, um, as I understand it, a lot of technical issues and engineering issues that relate to um, conversion of refrigerators to um, using different types of fuels like uh, propane or, or, or others <clears throat> that don't have uh, the same problem that, that HFC, HFCs and the other uh, foreign carbons have. Um, there are disposal issues, there are technical issues related to how the machines are actually constructed. So this was not as simple a thing as saying, guys, we want you to redo your refrigerators, and by the way, we'd like to have them in three months. Uh, it, it, it took time to develop the engineering protocols and to make sure that these refrigerators were, were going to be safe, which is another issue that we might want to talk about a little bit, because they use um, gases in many cases that are combustible and can be dangerous if they're not properly handled. <coughs> uh, so there were engineering issues that we had to work our way through. But we didn't have a problem at all with our uh, suppliers 
there are also issues because these units have fixed lifespans, and even when you're using, uh, so even when you're using climate-friendly gas in them, you still have an issue at the end of the lifespan. And even if it's 10 years or 15 years down the road, these units eventually compressors go, and you know fittings start to rust out and that sort of stuff. So you've got end use issues as well. So one of the features of this is, in our case, and I think, um, I would imagine is also the case with, with my colleagues up here, is that there are protocols in place that relate to how you deal with this equipment when, it runs, when its lifespan is included, including disposal, safe disposal of the, of the gases. I hope that answers your question. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I think um, same same general uh, comment. I mean, we've been in dialogue with our suppliers for the last 10 years on this. Um, you know, beginning, I think we've, we've actually spent about $60 million in R&D on uh, identifying, you know, the best options for our system globally. And, and we actually announced in, in 2004, although we, you know, we look at a wide range of, of technologies, um, that, that ironically CO2 refrigerant uh, gas would be the optimum choice for our system uh, uh, to cover the full spectrum of refrigeration equipment. So, you know, hydrocarbons, isobutane, propane, David mentioned, um, are also, um, you know, widely used, but there's a, a charge limit. And so in order to do larger systems, um, you know, for us, the CO2 uh, really covers more of the, uh, of the spectrum. But we've been working intensively with suppliers globally, you know, from, uh, from uh, Japan to, uh, to Denmark to Brazil in uh, identifying cost-effective solutions. Um, we uh, worked very closely with them in phasing out of insulation, which by June of 2006, you know, we uh, no longer were putting HFCs in insulation uh, anywhere in our system around the world. So you know, five years ago, we had stopped with, with that, and that was with the support uh, and alignment with our supply base, uh, who found out, you know, not ironically, but, but coincidentally, that it was, in many cases, more efficient than the HFC. Uh, insulation foam that we had been using. So another great example of green innovation that generates sort of productivity benefits. Yeah. Could, Henry, could I yeah. just mention one other thing? Uh, uh, to go back to a point you raised earlier in your introduction about the seriousness of this, um, the, our, our people would, would I've been told by their review of the literature suggests that if, if Copenhagen is fully implemented people do everything that they committed to do in COVID-19. Um, the, the globe will still fall short in terms of what it needs to do in, in terms of greenhouse gas reduction in order to stop to the end made contributions to global warming um, by about 10 to 15 percent or so. Um, and this is an area where that 10 to 15 percent can be made, a large part of it can be made up. If Copenhagen happens, and they do, I'm sorry, I got this backwards. If, if Copenhagen does not happen and nobody implements it, it's going to be 10 to 15 percent. If Copenhagen does happen and everybody makes all the commitments, the remaining greenhouse gases that are out there, this, this type of gas usage is going to represent something between 30 to 45 percent of what's still out there, and which is even more, which is going to be even more significant. So. Uh, this is a major issue, and one of the challenges that we have uh, going forward is getting more people into the sandbox. Yes, and actually, uh, we have we all go through the best way to try to explain these numbers, and um, on any given day, any one of us will use a variety of different ways to explain this. But one simple way that I try to use is that when Walmart four years ago measured its carbon footprint, refrigeration and cooling was the number two piece of the pie. The third piece was its trucking fleet, which is the largest trucking fleet in the world, which gives you a sense. It's for the first piece in their wedge is the electricity that runs their stores, and the second largest piece of their footprint is refrigeration and cooling. So if you can imagine, it's a big problem. The, the single largest for us, as it says, is 15 million metric tons of CO2 out of about 39 million for our total, total uh, emissions. 
Before I, I move to Raj, let me ask you one more question, which is um, Greenpeace was instrumental in getting your attention. What is the role of Greenpeace or other environmental organizations in implementing this program and moving forward with it? Well, um, David may want to add to this, but I, I think it, it's been a uh, actually a tremendous partnership. I mean, born out of the, the sort of the trust that we built in Refrigerants Naturally, uh, the, the, the newly created forum called the Consumer Goods Forum that represents uh, leading retail and, and consumer goods companies uh, globally, um, about 500 of them, with a total net revenue base of about 2.8 trillion dollars. So Walmart, Carrefour, Tesco. Etc. as well as PepsiCo, Coca-Cola, um, um, Unilever, P&G, et cetera. So, you know, very serious players uh, with the CEO-led board of directors of 50 CEOs. Um, as we began our deliberations around sustainability within the Consumer Goods Forum, we really looked to the Refrigerants Nationally collaboration and, and, and approach to uh, see what we could do to, to sort of um, elevate the approach from Refrigerants Nationally into the Consumer Goods Forum and under uh, with great support from, from Unilever, who chairs the Sustainability Committee, the Consumer Goods Forum. Uh, we led this effort and held a, um, a workshop uh, in Chicago in October of last year uh, that PepsiCo was, was, was very involved in and, and, and many others. Um, but we had about 18 <coughs> suppliers. Amy from Greenpeace came and provided a keynote address to kind of kick us off and, and really put the, 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 the policy issue and the real science issue of what we're there meeting about uh, into context. Uh, and, and Greenpeace has been there, you know, in a sense as, as, a, as a thought partner, as a leader. Their team in, in, in Europe and the U.S. deeply engaged on the regulatory side, on the science side, um, publishing um, uh, you know, documents that, that help educate. It's a tough issue, as Amy said. I mean, this is not a bumper sticker, right? It's, it's, by the time you explain the CFCs and HFCs, you know, you've, you've lost 99% of the people. So it's, it's really tough, but it's really important, as, as we've just heard. And, uh, and so I think they've, they've played that role and continue to play that role, you know, in raising awareness and, and motivating others to, to, to get engaged. The, I, I, I did Jeff summed that up really well, I think. Uh, the only thing I would add to this is I think uh, our, our civil society partners bring a couple of things to the table. Um, first of all, there's a degree of credibility uh, uh, both organizations both in that and with Greenpeace, um, that is, is very helpful. I think uh, they help keep us all honest, uh, and keep our nose to the grindstones. Uh, and then I think the, the third major um, thing that they, they do for us is to um, provide a, a reality check and uh, on, on the work that we on the work that we those are the major things that they that they help us that they help us with. They told us that they they are very happy to dance with us on this issue, but prepared to dance on us on other issues. So <laughs> there, there is a fine line that we have to walk. You want to add anything? I, I just want to say that um, I cannot stress enough how the need for courage of the individuals within corporations are necessary for this kind of partnership to work. It only works because the people here and their colleagues step forward, get beaten up within their own corporations, stand up again and say, sorry, we have to do this. Stand up again the next time they're beaten up. Stand up again the next time they're beaten up. Stand up again and say, we have to spend this money. Stand up again, I mean, oh, you get the picture. Um, My great headache. Well, well, for that, I mean, but, but they do this, these, uh, you know, the people here that have worked with us that basically have led the transformation of the sector to eliminate a horrible greenhouse gas that they really didn't want to bother to do, took courage. And Jeff Seabright and David and his colleagues at Unilever and Emad at PepsiCo and others within the Consumer Goods Forum and McDonald's in other ways. You don't do this unless you are prepared to get ridiculed, assaulted by your colleagues, you are giving me a pain in the neck, you have to work this weekend, sorry. Uh, it's going to cost money, sorry. It is worth doing and 
I cannot say enough that it only works. How many, you can ask a question, how many people in this room with a show of hands make buying decisions in a supermarket in part, at least, on what you perceive to be the corporate uh, social responsibility profile or behavior of the company whose product you're buying? Okay. That's Cambridge. why. This is okay. Cambridge, though. I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. we're, we're over. I mean, it's the Cambridge. We're over Harvard. <laughs> okay. People's Republic of Massachusetts. I understand <laughs> that 20% um, of consumers globally and a higher percentage in the United States base their buying decisions in part on those factors. Okay. We well, never got beat up internally because we understood that. And that, that's a number that's rising. So uh, I don't know. I appreciate the compliment. I don't know the courage. Uh, Alan Gerard started this work within you ever. That, well, that, that's true. On his own. Yeah. I mean. It always starts with one. Yes. It always starts with one person who is willing to stand up. He stood up on his own. Uh, let me turn to uh, Raj. Uh, you have been involved with the ozone issue uh, most of your career. Uh, you were involved in the discussions leading up to the Montreal Protocol. Uh, you are now head of the Ozone Action uh, uh, Program at uh, UNEP. When the um, protocol went through and uh, you phased out the gases that were contributing to the ozone hole, and you had a solution, and you had a solution that now we decide is the cause of major problems. Um, how do you, what is your reaction to uh, the whole process by which you solved one problem, and now, 20 years later, you're on a panel to discuss how it caused another problem? Uh, thank you very much, first of all, to, for inviting the uh, United Nations Environment Program. And congratulations to the partners who had an amazing job. And uh, quite appreciation to the Roy family for recognizing this uh, unparalleled and amazing efforts of the partners. Uh, <clears throat> let me begin by saying that I have been associated, unlike the other panel members, with this initiative right from the beginning, from the year 2000. So I have seen the trials and tribulations of this group, uh, their psychology, and maybe their uh, I, I didn't get migraines, but I've, I've seen them going through the pains. Uh, but let me let me start with a lighter remarks, uh, Dr. Lee, that uh, in 2004, this partnership was registered with United Nations Commission for Sustainable Development. Uh, because the goal uh, number uh, eight of Millennium Development Goals said that if at all the seven goals are to be achieved, you require an eighth goal of doing the things in partnership. At that time, my executive director, um, um, Dr. Taufer, called me and said that you are registering this partnership and you are one of the supporters along with the Greenpeace. Do you know what you are doing? And you are joining the hands. The United Nations is considered as a sort of an environmental hub, a, a voice of United Nations, like an environment protection agency of United Nations. And uh, you are not supposed to be the activist. And you are supposed to work uh, to inspire people and provide the leadership on environmental issues uh, and uh, that is the time when I have to explain to him that it is the partners who themselves have sought the advice from United Nations Environment Program. It's not that we are joining hands with Greenpeace per se, but it is the partners who are seeking the information, who are seeking some kind of a leadership role from the international organization to understand the issue which Dr. Lee you talked about, that in the year 2000, the developed countries had just finished eliminating CFCs and the developing countries had started on eliminating. There was a starting, 2000 was a starting point for 146 developing countries to start eliminating CFCs by staying put and then step by step decreasing it, its production and consumption. And in 2010, 1st January, the job was done. But going back to year 2000, that was not the situation and these companies particularly Coca-Cola, McDonald's, and Unilever, they came and saying that, well, we went through a difficult time in implementing the Montreal Protocol. We phased out CFCs, but we phased in, of course, HCFC, which has not been talked about. I don't want to go in detail. 
because we already been burdened with a lot of uh, technicalities. But we also faced in HFCs, and that happened mainly in the developed countries because developing countries had just started doing it. So this was a dilemma that you dig up somewhere, but put that soil somewhere else. But these companies wanted to do something different, so they came and asked, "Are there any technologies which avoid the pitfalls of HFCs and go beyond?" And what we did. Because there is something called as an assessment panel of technology, economic, and assessment panel, like IPCC, which is for climate change. There is a United Nations Environment Program assessment panel, which had said that such technologies exist. You don't have to go to HFCs, but we needed some kind of a leadership role there, and this partnership shown it. And they decided to get together to find out those technologies which do not resort to HFCs, and they started saying that. It's not just the operational performance that matter, but you are talking about the environmental performance and the social performance of the technologies. So this was something different that came out, and what really happened was the partnership started looking at not only eliminating the HFCs from their operation, but United Nations Environment Program inspired them to look beyond that to get some kind of an energy efficiency of the appliances. Which in fact is 90% responsibility of reducing the carbon dioxide emissions come from the energy efficiency, and this is where we started with that. Yes, the emission of HFCs is important. It's a man-made gas. It's a long-term uh, impact on environment, but also the energy efficiency of the appliances which these companies deploy in a marketplace is also need to be improved. So the real issue came up improving the energy efficiency of the appliances apart from getting rid of HFCs. So I think that was one of the contributions this partnership has made. Thank you, um, Alan. Uh, you uh, worked in business uh, for a number of years, and then you became Secretary of Environmental Affairs. When in business, uh, you know the, the role of government and NGOs was basically a potential headache, uh, making it difficult to do what you had to do, making it having to spend more money in order to meet standards. Then you reverse roles. Then you were the person that actually called on business. Now, I wonder if you could reflect a little bit about the role of partnerships and how difficult it is to see this type of partnership replicated in other areas in which you've worked. I'd like to make two comments to start. One is that I think uh, some of you may know I was a student here, and I actually had a lot of professors who talked about, including some here, Henry and Bill Hogan, um, about the fact that you need to bring stakeholders to the table early in the process, uh, whether you're in the government side or the business side, uh, in order to get anything done effectively, because you will hit the wall one way or the other if you don't. Um, and if you only put in the room the people who share your point of view, you won't get out of the room. <laughs> you'll just all be have a love fest, and uh, and then you'll go out and get eaten alive. Uh, so I think that that was an important component of the schooling here, and particularly of the people that I uh, was schooled by. Uh, so that when when I went out into the world in business, and I want to recognize that my two brothers, Stephen and Peter, started this business, uh, the energy sector cogeneration in the 80s, early on, uh, where uh, there was a lot of um, regulatory uh, change happening uh, both in the electricity sector and in the uh, gas um, distribution sector, uh, which really was like four-dimensional chess if you were a small developer, which we were. Uh, and actually, there's an individual here, a, a wonderful lawyer, Harold Hestis, I want to recognize a graduate of Harvard as well, and his wife, um, who were sorting through all this in real time and understanding um, how those pieces might move, and that wasn't our business. We were simply trying to figure out um, at some level how to build these cogen plants uh, and what that took. And, uh, and it really uh, was uh, enormously important to have people who understood the regulatory component of the business model and, so, uh, and the need to bring in the stakeholders uh, early on. And I think that that is what is so clear here. Um, that uh, Greenpeace may have been uh, the uh, instigator of the, this needs to be done. But when you look at this, they have a little chart of the timeline. The UN was starting in it earlier. 1986 is the, uh, the, the protocol from Montreal taking on this problem. We're now 25 years in. Uh, we're going to be going on 25 years from now trying to address this problem in a continuum. Uh, so I think that that coalition of public and private partnerships are essential 
to maintain and achieve anything meaningful. Um, and that's really what we had in mind when we were funding this award, uh, was to try to look for examples across the world uh, where there were people getting together um, in a really productive manner to, for you know, technological innovation, I think um, it's very interesting uh, that Amy talked about the way corporations can move quickly and fundamentally, uh, which I think is an important recognition uh, of how you get things done. You must bring the government and you must bring the business and you must bring all the stakeholders together uh, to achieve change. Uh, so that really, I think, is an important element. And I certainly saw it when I was on the flip side, when I was the environmental secretary, uh, if there was something meaningful to get done, and in this state, biotechnology and um, in general, the, the ad industry uh, had a lot of um, issues, and there are a lot of other interesting issues where environment is by uh, agencies are really silos of environmental problems. So you have the water area, and you have the uh, air area, and you have the waste management area of your regulatory system. But the uh, most um, impacted customer uh, is really the industry that's being regulated. And they're not being regulated by just the water. They're actually uh, experiencing regulation through all these different um, windows of the departments, you know, the water department uh, regulations, the uh, waste management, the air, and it becomes a clutter of unorganized um, and uncoordinated uh, process, which really can hold back innovation, uh, not to mention economic growth. And so one of the things that we did actually was try to uh, marry the uh, normal organization of environmental agencies uh, and put in the secretary's office where I was, um, businesses, um, business sector orientations, you know, business relationships directly with the biotech industry, for instance, and other technologies, where we would bring everybody into the same room. We'd have all the, the uh, environmental agencies and their different departments sitting in the same room with the technology and the industry that they were working with to try to work through a program um, of actually performance standards, another favorite thing, but I won't get into that. Um, but basically for biotech, we created a process where we updated everything with the industry, with the environmental groups, and we did this in a number of sectors, and that was the one we led with. Because you really needed to bring everybody together in a coherent way. And just coming back to this particular point, where you were working on, originally, the ozone layer problem, which morphs into the CO2 problem, um, which has the co-benefit of energy efficiency, uh, which reduces the overall impact and footprint for these companies um, on the, uh, you know, both air and water, et cetera. Uh, you know, that's a very complicated problem. So it's very important to everybody in the room. Before I open it up to uh, questions from the audience, uh, let me ask one more uh, sort of for the whole panel or for whoever feels most comfortable with it. Uh, your success has been very impressive in this partnership, but it's been focused on everywhere but the United States. And in the U.S., when you look at fluorocarbons, you, you, you're looking at, um, uh, or fluorinated gases, you're looking at uh, not only uh, your industries, uh, vending machines, uh, products sold out of vending machines, uh, coolers and refrigerants, you're also looking at air conditioners and uh, automobile air conditioners. So this is a huge market here. Uh, why has it been so difficult to get the United States to move? And what do you see in the next couple of years? Do you see any movement in this area? All right. I've been, I've been, uh, Jeff has nominated me. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff's been in government before. This when is why. <laughs> well, so so have I. Uh, uh, I have a 20-foot pole that I carry around for things that I wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole. And I, I think it's maybe one, of, maybe one of those. Are we on the record here? Just go um, ahead. Just... Okay. Okay. Um, at dinner, we won't be. All right. I'll. Uh, okay. Let me let me answer this. Let me answer it this way. Um, uh, the U.S. government. Now, uh, the, the, the U.S. government and the Environmental Protection Agency do a lot of really fine work. Um, but but EPA is not an an, or, an, an institution that is known for uh, agility, and uh, there are a lot of. Um, administrative and regulatory and legal processes that EPA's got to go through before they can change rules. And so one of the challenges that we've got here now in the refrigeration area is that um, the EPA rules don't allow for this type of technology to be used in the United States. Uh, ben and Jerry's, uh, a little 
uh, ice cream company in, uh, in Vermont, uh, put in an application for um, for use of uh, uh, climate friendly Hydro yeah, hydrocarbons uh, with EPA under their SNAP program. Uh, SNAP has a couple of different meanings depending on how young and hip you are. Uh, but in this case, it's a significant alternative, um, a new alternative, significant new alternative uh, program. Thank you. Uh, under uh, under EPA, and um, the only thing I can say is sort of watch the space. There are several hundred um, refrigeration units, ice cream cabinets, which are a test around the country. A whole bunch of them here in the Boston area, actually. Although I could not tell you where they actually are. Um, but if you spot a, a freezer cabinet that's got a lot of Ben and Jerry's in it, uh, or Good Humor Briars, which is our other major ice cream brand, the chances are pretty good. It's probably one of the test ones. And the last I heard was that we were expecting to hear something from EPA uh, sometime this spring. And if they approve the petition, um, that will then open the floodgates to use of this technology, not, not only for refrigeration, but I said one thing to this is that, you know, the big concern is that the fundability. Have any in Europe, where you've had to smoke a lot of these, uh, have any of them caught on fire? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. I, I'd like to answer this um, because I'm allowed to say this. The reason why uh, the natural refrigerant alternatives are not legal in the United States is that the lobbyists for the chemical industry are very, very effective. I'm allowed to say this. Um, it is a long story that we don't need to go into here, but there have been lies, statistics, lies, statistics, lies, statistics thrown at this issue from the chemical industry lobbyists, effectively preventing the EPA from <coughs> changing its ruling until this year, the last year when the chemical industry wants to introduce a flammable alternative to HFCs, all of a sudden the EPA has said, in fact, oh, actually, a flammable refrigerant is not so bad because, of course, you engineer and design your equipment around it, and it's not as if they blow up. There are 500 million domestic refrigerators around the world produced by every major manufacturer, Bosch, Sanyo, Whirlpool, Samsung, they're not blowing up. There are 600,000 or so hydrocarbon Unilever coolers around the world. Unilever is not going to put its name on a cooler that is going to blow up because that's not going to serve them. Bosch alone has sold about 75 million refrigerators. The EPA, all of a sudden, however many millions of units later, it's finally decided it is okay to allow flammable refrigerants because obviously you design for them not to blow up. In addition, they're more efficient than HOCs and the ruling, there is a, the EPA ruling has to coincide also with an underwriter's laboratory ruling and that is where this change in the regulation is now. And as David said, it's very shortly going to change. And just to add to that, I mean, there, are, there are two major technologies, hydrocarbons and, and CO2, as I, as I mentioned earlier. We actually launched um, CO2 uh, cold drink uh, equipment at the U.S. Capitol uh, last year um, at, at an event to raise awareness. And, and so what we have a uh, Coca-Cola vending machines in the U.S. Capitol that are refrigerants naturally machines. Uh, so, you know, kind of hoping to, to break some of the logjam in terms of this can be done. We, in terms of, of, of our program, have applied for the SNAP approval for CO2 refrigerants uh, in the United States. That's now pending before EPA. And again, you know, watch this space. We hope to hear by the end of the year, but um, but, but, but no guarantees. I would, I would also add that, you know, on this consumer goods form that I mentioned earlier, we did have some EPA representation, not the most, you know, senior folks that we yeah. had. A hundred people screaming at her. Yeah, well, it was, it was an interesting dialogue. Um, but I mean, <laughs> um, we, we're, we're going to be hosting uh, the, the Consumer Goods Forum, and the, the board of the Consumer Goods Forum, on behalf of the organization, passed a resolution at their meeting in Paris in, in December of last year to uh, that the company, member companies of the Consumer Goods Forum would work to phase out of HFCs 
um, you know, beginning in the middle of this, this, this decade, right? So we have 500 leading companies in the retail sector, including Walmart, and we're, you know, they're very much engaged in this discussion and, and, and many others, uh, to, to, to really move in the same direction that we have really pioneered through refrigerants naturally. So there's now a much broader um, platform to do that. We're going to be hosting uh, a meeting, the Consumer Goods Forum will host a meeting here in the U.S. in Atlanta in late, late September, early October, bring suppliers, uh, 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 retailers, you know, uh, consumer goods manufacturers such as ourselves uh, and, and others, and, and Greenpeace and EPA, and hopefully begin to, to further advance this dialogue. Can I, can I, can I, can I make a comment? Then I'll, I'll let me come back. Well, I actually wanted to do a okay. was a segue right. to, to Raj. Uh, uh, Jeff pointed out earlier that, that one of the s significant aspects of the consumer goods forum is that it's not just a small group of companies who do most of their business in Europe and the United States. It is a global group of global companies. And the big challenge is, uh, as, as much as we can be proud of the, the leading edge role that this, that this coalition has played, and we're doing stuff that's way ahead of where the consumer goods forum is, because the companies there globally aren't going to start doing stuff until 2015, and that's that's not for another four years. I mean, there's some of them may do it right here, sure. but um, but they're not required to do it under their own commitments in 2015. But the, the the real challenge here, probably going forward, is not so much in in the United States or in Europe, right. as much as it is in the deep in the developing and emerging economies, because that's where the growth is. The growth is in China and India and Brazil those kinds of con countries who are going to start emulating our patterns of living um, at, at a certain point as their economies grow. And there's, a, there's enormous opportunity to help guide those countries into doing the right thing as opposed to the wrong thing which they have to clean up afterwards about. And UNEP, I would imagine, can play a very significant role in that. Yes, I just wanted to uh, respond to uh, your question about uh, USC. Uh, in, in 2005, uh, Jeff, if I remember, is a US EPA awarded this partnership yes. of refrigerants yeah. and good, yeah. as, a, as a special award. What it means is uh, that there is a recognition of the basic principles of this partnership, and that is to make sure that it is not only we are going to the natural refrigerants per se, but also trying to, through the natural refrigerants, trying to improve the energy efficiency of the whole operations, which are, which are forced to take about 90% about of the total job as in terms of the carbon dioxide emission. So, though the, I mean, there is a dichotomy in USA, which is always present in any of the circumstances in, in USA, is that uh, while the, there is an appreciation of the efforts which are going on in the in right kind of direction, but there are opposing forces which does not allow to formalize the show things. And that's why probably it took some time for USA to make sure that some of the natural refrigerants which were prevented are now slowly getting into, in, uh, into the legal issues like hydrocarbons. It, take, it took time. But uh, I just wanted to remind that USA did appreciate this partnership way back in 2005, just one year after it was formulated. Thanks. I'm going to, all right, Amy, then I'm going to open it up, but the microphone's on either side. Just one more thing on uh, American regulation. About two and a half years ago, Brian Jacob from Coca-Cola, Mike Saba from PepsiCo, and Pete Gosselin from Ben & Jerry's Unilever joined us meeting with the staff of three different congressional committees the Congressional Science Committee, Energy and Commerce, and the Senate uh, Foreign Relations. And it was, I think, uh, it was before the climate bill when there was still the hope that there actually might be a climate bill. But we were, I think one of the, uh, that, that comes out of this partnership also, the understanding that we have to change this policy. And again, I go back to the courage of these partners they came to Congress with Greenpeace. And the beauty part, as far as I was concerned, is that Brian Jacob and his colleagues were talking about the dangers of the HFCs and how they could, in fact, be well replaced 
and we're better for the environment, more energy efficient, and we advocated on behalf of incentivizing these companies because they should be rewarded and should be given the ability to help transform their sector with good public policy. And I think that's a current for them. Uh, thank you. Uh, what I'm going to do now is open this up, but please state your name and uh, end your question with a question mark. Thank you. My name's Roger Shamel. I'm a alum of the business school and currently the president of a small chemical consulting firm and also of a nonprofit called the Global Warming Education Network. I'd like to make a comment and then lead into a question. I'm, I've been uh, interested in this subject since I worked at Arthur D. Little in the 70s when we did a huge study for the EPA about regulating fluorocarbons. And uh, I remember flammability of hydrocarbons was the big issue. And it's interesting how we've gone from the frying pan into the boiling pot and <laughs> now we're trying to get out. And what I see going on here is some, sort of a business and climate analyst is that what's going on in this room is really how things should work. Now, I applaud Greenpeace and the UN and the corp corporations involved for doing this and, and the Montreal Protocol was an example of government doing the same good thing. But now I look out there and this isn't a political comment, although I have switched parties since the 70s, but it seems like our current Republican Party has this group think thing led by Jim, Jim Inhofe of Oklahoma that this climate change thing is a hoax. I've personally been into Scott Brown's office with my wife Susan and we've tried to educate him and encourage him to consult Harvard and MIT about the science but he refuses to listen. Your question? And the question is, um, given that the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, which represents many large corporations, is also in the same arena, is it possible that to preserve your future businesses and a livable climate, that these corporations should be doing even more to assure that we have a livable climate in five or 10 or 50 years? Simple, direct question. Well, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I would just say, you know, one of the ways that, that I think we think about the environmental work that we do and the challenges that we have collectively and, and then within the, the company is sort of in, in three parts, the footprint, handprint, blueprint, right? Uh, and, and the reality is you know, we have a footprint, a carbon footprint, um, doing what we can to reduce the, the emissions associated with our operations globally is an important thing to do. We're working hard on that. We've got goals, we've got partnerships, just like uh, Unilever has and, and, and most other sort of leading multinational companies. But the reality is that, you know, simply making less of a mess um, <laughs> as we continue to grow is not going to fix the big challenges that we have on the global basis, right? So managing your footprint is not going to get us where we need to go. Mm -hmm. um, handprint is, is sort of where companies, excuse me, can, can actually bend the arc of business as usual by using what they do well and do best and have a particular advantage. In our case, you know, we buy a lot of refrigeration equipment. PepsiCo buys a lot of refrigeration equipment. This is a way that we can uh, contribute by, through leadership uh, in partnership to, to, leave, to, to, to affect um, a benefit much greater than reducing our own footprint. Right? So if we're successful in what we're doing collectively here in phasing out F gases, it will be a one or two percent reduction in, in where we are by 2050, or m maybe more, um, from business as usual. But it's going to take, you know, as John Holdren, uh, you know, said, it's going to it's going to be silver buckshot. We're going to need a whole bunch of one percent solutions that aggregate up cogeneration, you know, uh, F gas work, et cetera. That's what it's going to take. Uh, and so I think the handprint part, I think, is a very important um, part that companies can play, in addition to the footprint, because the footprint alone is going to get it. And then we need the blueprint, right? We need the public policy. Uh, that is actually going to set the, the sort of the big frame under which uh, all this great innovation and, and, and energy uh, can be unleashed and, and targeted and focused. And I think that's that, that's critical, and, and that's where we're struggling right now on a global basis. There's no question about that. Let me just ask, is your company strongly in favor of congressional action on climate? You know, we've said that we're uh, that, that, that we, we believe that we need to have a price on carbon, that the, the science is compelling, uh, that this is a real issue. Um, you know, we're, we're yes. very much on that view. We have not 
in the United States because we, we have other priorities and not gotten involved in uh, advocating for the gov government on climate. But globally, uh, we've been very supportive of basically the same position that Jeff has taken. Your chair and our international secretary for recent report are not bad together. Yeah. In Europe. Yeah. So, so we have. I, I'm reminded that, that that old story that you know when I was 15 years old, I was I couldn't believe that how stupid my father was, and by the time I graduated from high school, I couldn't believe on how much he had learned from me. <laughs> uh, I say this because if you if you get uh, to try to answer your question a little bit, I, and I I serve on a chamber of commerce committee actually. It's on international trade policy, not this area. Um, but I can tell you that, that even within business associations, there are very spirited debates about these types of issues. Um, there's an old expression in Washington that there are no, which is a bastardization, I think, of either Austerlitz or Israeli, I forget uh, which one. Uh, the, in politics, there are no permanent friends uh, or permanent enemies, only permanent interests. And that's how you can have a group like this come together where you have a common interest. Um, and there might be some other issue where we and Greenpeace, uh, or we and Coca-Cola and Pepsi could be on opposite sides as well. So this is very much of an oleo. It's a very much of a, of a, of a jambalaya, if you will, uh, in the way that the policy on these issues get, get made both within companies and also within uh, trade associations. The key thing, as somebody pointed out earlier, is that, as Ellen pointed out, if you can get people to sit down together and then provide them with some political cover, because this is basically, it's good that we're talking about this at the Kennedy School, because this is basically a political operation. We don't think of it that way, but that's just, this is a very political exercise. And you get people to sit down in the room and provide them with some political cover um, that can help them deal with their own stakeholders who might not have the same view um, as, as, as you may. Then it's, it's amazing what you can get done. Thanks. My name is Doug Coppola. I'm with Earth Track in Cambridge. One thing that struck me about this discussion is that we have, by all definition, a very successful partnership. But from the time people acknowledge that there was a problem till the point in time when your equipment, your old equipment, is actually gone, we're still talking a period of 25 or 30 years. And we know that we have a window to deal with climate change and that we probably need 20 or 30 or 50 of these types of structural transformations. And I guess my question to the panel is, knowing what you know now, if you were to go back to 2000 or to 1995, have you learned things that would allow you to accelerate this process if you had to do it again? Or do you believe that all these types of transformations will just take 20 or 30 years? Who has courage here? Who has a drink? <laughs> <laughs> That's a really hard question. Wow. Well, How many prices do you have? Yeah. That's a hard question. Uh, Does anyone want to want to try it? I mean, it, 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 the the challenge is that that you know the 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 urgent versus the you know the the important, right? And so you know when you're dealing with the challenge. Of, of climate change that is a future, you know, time horizon, and getting the sense of urgency, which you know, you read the news today about sea level rise and some of the projections that, that, that are out there. Um, it, you know, it, it it should drive a sense of urgency, but but you know, we're not able to translate that effectively into a political consensus on the path forward. Uh, and and I think you know the, that is the, the fundamental challenge that we have is to is to reconcile the two. And I, so I don't have an answer for you. I, I, I guess if I were to try and simplify the question, are there things about the processes within your own companies that you've learned from this particular thing that would allow you to implement changes more quickly in the future? That's a hard question. It, really, I mean, this is a great. This would be a great. Thesis, thesis. Great, a, doc, a great dissertation for somebody who's getting a degree here and across the river at the Peace School. Um, it, I was not around at the beginning, so I kind of came to the party a little bit late um, in, in terms of my personal involvement, although I've been with the company for a long time. Um, 
I can tell you that our our internal decision making process and our R and D and engineering processes are considerably more streamlined and more agile than they were a decade ago. And 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 how I'm just expressing a personal opinion as an observer inside my own company, um, I have to believe that one of the experiences that we went through that helped us make those changes amongst all sorts of others so is involvement in this type of program. Because we, we do learn from this internally. And I suspect that part of the way we operate now is due to the lessons that we learned. Although don't ask me to pin down a specific example because I couldn't I couldn't give you one. I, I would just say I mean I, I think I think the, the, the there's been an evolution just broadly, right, not caused by any particular event. I mean, I, when I think of the range of things that we're engaged in now, we don't really do anything out, without a partner or a web of relationships that, that make it possible, you know, whether it's government or UN or, you know, other businesses or, 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 or um, you know, our suppliers, our customers, et cetera. So that, 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 that notion of kind of working in your ecosystem to, to drive um, um, benefit and change is, is very much, I think, kind of where, where we are. Yes. I just wanted to say that uh, what has happened up till now with uh, these four partners uh, and what I have seen it uh, developing over the last uh, 10 years is that uh, there is a tremendous capability in terms of the technology change that can happen. The question comes that the technology operates within the policy framework of the government. And that is what the basic drag is. I think all of these companies are extremely capable of changing all their operations in just a couple of years to the what is called the natural refrigerants. We are talking about a carbon dioxide, hydrocarbon, those kind of things. But what happens is the policy scenario that keeps on dragging the technologies, changes, is, is still uh, the, in terms of uh, not making the changes often, not making the changes faster enough, which this earth desires. And I think that is the main issue. So it's a question of policy makers and the technology changes coming together. And I'm sure even the policy makers in the private sector also get aligned with the policy makers in the government to drag this change and make it happen long. So what is needed today is is the policy makers in the private sector getting aligned to the potential of the technology, recognize that that can change the world, and trying to make a totally independent scenario as it happened in case of refrigerants naturally here in only a very small way. And there are others who are making changes who are not here. For example, the Red Bull is changing their operations into the hydrocarbons totally. And there are many people who got inspired by this partnership. But then partners, the original partners have to do much more than what they have done up till now. I think their pace has to improve in a very steep way, having done this for last more than 10 years. 10 years is the three generations in a private sector. And, and we are not seeing that much happen. I, I, think, um, I think that the issue of luck has in all business and all life and all progress is a crucial piece of this so that the consumer goods forum you, you have to keep doing your work and everybody here in all these companies has kept doing their work and then the consumer goods forum was formed which had nothing to do with refrigerants naturally uh, and then voila scale up I mean we were ready we were prepped we were primed all the work had been done internally and so we could seize the opportunity McDonald's is trying to do something similar with food equipment manufacturers. I, I think that you keep doing your work, and then when the windows open, you try to pry the windows open, and then when they open, you run in. And I think that's, uh, from, from our point of view, in every campaign we run, we look for what window is open. Bill? Uh, Bill Hogan from the uh, Kennedy School. Um, uh, I should say, as an aside, I just ordered a new refrigerator and I'm feeling guilty. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, 
Uh, I recently attended a seminar here with a prominent uh, climate policy analyst and advocate. It was off the record, so I won't tell you who it was. But um, the, the purpose of it was to diagnose what the scientific community and the political, the policy analysts and advocates of this issue had done wrong, uh, which led to the unraveling of the uh, efforts to have climate policy in Washington and so forth. And prominent in that list, there was a series of things, but prominent in that list was that the advocates of change had uh, promised that it would be cheap and easy, um, which then leads me to my question here. Uh, the best of all possible answers to the question I'm, here, I'm going to ask you in a moment would be that this was real expensive, but it was worth it, and we overcame those barriers, and then that is transferable to lots of other applications of the economy and other situations. Uh, uh, the answer might be the other way, which is now cheap and easy. Um, how much did this cost? Well, I mean, I, I can just maybe kick it off for, for, for Coke. As I mentioned earlier, we've spent about $60 million in R&D, right, in, in, in really looking at the technologies and, and working with our suppliers uh, to, to uh, engage in that and, and understanding what technology would fit for us. And you have to understand in this space, every application is different. Unilever has the most, I think, um, natural refrigerants at 600 plus thousand. Those are steady state ice cream freezers, right? So they have a different kind of mechanical requirement. We have point of sale equipment that requires quick drawdown time, so it has to be a different kind of mechanical um, uh, function, and, and et cetera. So you sort of you get into the engineering, and it gets a little bit, you know, a little bit challenging. But we spent about 60 million on that. You know, we're now in the phase of we have about 300,000 units equally split between CO2 and hydrocarbon in, in, in about I don't know, eight or nine countries around the world now. And we're wrapping up to meet our goal by 2015 of, of no longer purchasing uh, HFC equipment. As we do that, the new equipment, you know, is is challenging and is well established. Uh, maybe made a reference to it. A uh, well established incumbent technology uh, you know, we're using it ourselves today. Uh, that is very cost effective based on the fact it's been around for a long time. So as we try to get there, right now there is a cost premium. We believe that it will be how much. You know, it, it, it depends. I mean, Antoine probably has all the all the numbers in his head, and I, that's probably you know procurement sensitive at this point. But we do believe that once the market reaches a scale, roughly 500,000 units or so, that it will be commercially viable and, 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 and you know with effective cost parity. So it's a question in this case not of uh, of an intrinsic barrier, a cost barrier, but of scale, right? So that if you're buying know, 100 units, you're going to custom make 100 units, it's going to be very expensive. Right. If you can put in the installed capacity and justify the capital investment to create a dedicated, you know, effective production to, uh, line at, at scale, you can drive it down, we, we believe, to, to effective cost parity. So it's really a question of kind of chicken egg. If we all jump in and make it so, it will be, it will be uh, competitively priced. If we all sort of remain niche players, it's going to be, it's going to be a challenge for all of us. Jeff? Uh, can you give us a price, can you give us a percent, is this 20% more, 30% more, 5% more? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, for not to go there. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> worth a try. Uh, <laughs> yes. Thanks. Uh, Nicholas Gerbler from Tapestry Networks. I wonder as you look forward, what is the next frontier for collaboration? And as you do that, is there a role for a third party convener? and making that collaboration perhaps more effective or faster to reach results? Collaboration on anything? Partnership on sustainability related issues, environment, water, air. I'm not quite sure how to, I'll, I'll try to take a stab at answering that. Um, we've got to, Stickier knitting is probably not the right analogy, but you got to you have to do what you know how to do. Um, and the, as I mentioned earlier, the, the big challenge going forward here, after you get over the hurdle of in, in the situation here in the U.S., is going to be in the, in the developing and emerging economies. And I think for once you, we get past the consumer goods forum exercise, and that gets up and running, which it will. Um, there was a issue or a challenge um, for this type of organization, which is, does it want to take or 
should it take the next step of, of essentially doing missionary work on a global level uh, and taking the knowledge it has and, and try to make it universal as opposed to uh, the stakeholders, the consumers and customers that we now dealing with. Um, I don't know if the group has talked about that at all, but if not, I imagine it would at some point. At the Lancer Fisher International meeting a few months ago, the group in the room said, here we are, we have achieved a huge piece of the goal. We have, you know, it is scaling up the Consumer Goods Forum. That was, to some degree, the mission. So what to do next? And the group said, well, why are we, Iman from PepsiCo was saying, why are we not working with this corporation? Why are we not working with that corporation? We know so much about this, we can help transform everything. We can transform every industry to teach what we know. And the group adopted that. So that is the new mission of the organization. To do exactly that, to take this into every other sector of the refrigeration and cooling. I would, uh, I would I would just add uh, you know there were two actual resolutions that were passed at the consumer goods board meeting uh, last year. The other one had to do with deforestation, uh, and deforestation, as we all know, contributes you know, nearly twenty percent to total warming potential, uh, and is is a, a huge uh, challenge. The consumer goods the, the the commitment is that we will work collectively as retailers, so the people that sell you stuff, and the people that make stuff, will sustainably source uh, palm oil soy, beef, and pulp fiber uh, uh, products uh, to avoid zero uh, net deforestation by 2020. That's a huge undertaking, right? What that means is the people that buy things and the people that make things are going to see to it that what they buy and what they sell you know, in, the, in their commercial operations are not going to contribute to deforestation. That's something Greenpeace has been very focused on. Palm oil, WWF has been very involved. Uh, there are four or five kind of subcommittees now working on that cross-sectorally, um, and I think that, that you know, that's a self, self, uh, sort, sort of self-started CGF, Consumer Goods Forum, uh, initiative, but working closely with, with NGO partners as well, and I think government clearly. So. Uh, Jeff, uh, I know I don't give up easy, but I want to ask you a question that touches on the issue that you mentioned before. If tomorrow a miracle occurred, and this Congress <laughs> passed a flight of bill, and it called for somewhere between a 30 and $50 a ton CO2 tax. How much a difference would it make in what you're doing now? A little bit, a moderate amount, or a lot? No, I, I think it would have a material like that. I mean, I'd have to run the numbers, but I would, I would think yes. So it could be significant. Uh, over here. Uh, Susan Shamel, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce has been one of the largest forces behind the obfuscation of sci climate science. Bill McKibben, the environmentalist um, in Middlebury, who is a graduate of Harvard, who started 350.org, has this program, this, this right now going on, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce does not speak for me. And Greenpeace did a similar thing um, a year ago. So my question to you is, are your companies members of the Chamber of Commerce? And if they are, since my grandchildren basically have no future if we don't get more aggressive with this climate action, would you consider removing yourselves or um, starting up a, a program to try to get your companies removed from the Chamber of Commerce and speaking out very loudly that the Chamber of Commerce is obfuscating the science and that you could maybe form a green Chamber of Commerce and try to get all everybody else over on board? Well, I can just speak for, 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 for Coke. Um, we we are a member of, of the Chamber of Commerce. They do a lot of different things. Uh, I think it was in 2009 we issued a statement uh, indicating that on the issue of climate change, the Chamber of Commerce does not speak for the Coca-Cola company. Then why don't you pull yourselves out? Because they're using your money to obfuscate the science, and this is abominable. Pull yourself out. All right, we have questions here. Um, Sorry. Okay. <laughs> uh, I've got about four minutes left in the program and we have four questions. So what I'd like to do is to ask each person to give their question and then I'm going to ask the panel to respond uh, to all four of the questions. Um, Tristan Roy, I'm obviously a bit young to have impressive credentials, but I was just wondering as far as the issue with the United States government having a lot of resistance 
towards implementing these new technologies. Um, would you think that these developing countries such as India, China, and a lot of these Asian countries, do you think they'd be almost more accepting, or do you see that as a bigger challenge in the future? Thank you. Uh, yes, could you uh, give us some other numbers? I know you were hesitant about the cost premium, but could you be more specific about the benefit side in terms of more efficiency and also the overall number in the U.S. Of, of the degree to which this problem is contributing to the greenhouse gas emissions problem. I don't have the kind of simple uh, picture here of, of what the argument would be. Rob. Rob Stowe, this is mainly for Raj. Uh, does it make sense legally and is it otherwise <coughs> feasible to um, expand the scope of the Montreal Protocol to include fluorinated gases that do not pose a threat to ozone, but do uh, have high uh, warming potential, especially uh, to provide the kind of policy support that we were discussing earlier for initiatives like this. Jack? So my question is beyond refrigerants, and it's an interest in technologies that deliver us the utility of coolness. How do we get to coolness? That's what we want. And uh, how do we do it? It with other technologies. Okay. Panel? Uh, you don't have to take them all. We, uh, as a whole, we have to take them all. But uh, well, you can choose which one does which. An easy answer is that, uh, to this young man, I don't know what it is, that. My um, nephew. Hey, the uh, <laughs> the young credential is invisible. <laughs> uh, the resistance to these technologies, to natural refrigerants in other parts of the world, as you can see on the map that we distributed, um, there's only one red area, and it's North America. It's everywhere else. Um, I'll try to tackle two of these. A couple of them are technical issues I really can't respond to. Um, the the DNA world is, is uh, unusual uh, in the sense that you've got very high growth rates. Uh, you know, the Chinese economic miracle took 300 million people out of poverty in about a generation, which is really, which is a country the size of the United States, went from poverty to middle class which is really quite extraordinary. And the first thing that people do when, um, when they come out of poverty is they buy uh, consumer goods, non-durable consumer goods, after they get an iPhone, maybe. Okay. <laughs> but, but they buy Coca-Cola, and they buy Pepsi, and they buy Unilever detergent and toothpaste and soaps and so forth. Um, they tend to be very entrepreneurial, really focused. And if you can make an economic case that getting involved in this type of activity is something that will benefit them uh, personally in addition to what it will do for the planet. That's a very important driver. Um, it's not an accident that, that China is making more wind turbines than we are right now because they saw a business opportunity, a huge business opportunity. So in theory, I think there's, there's a lot of fertile land out there in the DE world that um, is, is out there and, and I think is, is available and people will take advantage of. Um, so I'm inclined to think that they'll, they'll, they'll be more uh, accepting of these uh, types of solutions to climate change if they see that it's in their economic uh, interest to do it, even if they, you know, if they don't have quite the social consciousness. On the other question, um, how do we get the coolness? I would just say, listen to a lot of John Coltrane. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I agree with what David just said about John Coltrane. Now, about uh, about developing countries, and uh, you know, one one of the things actually that we did with, with Greenpeace, our former uh, chairman and CEO Neville Isdell, um, went to China, and we worked with Greenpeace to host a, um, a sort of a green business. Um, uh, refrigerants-focused uh, conference in, in Beijing and, and used our business network in China to invite, I think, several hundred uh, Chinese companies to be part of that dialogue. And I think, you know, it's hard to pick up a paper and not see uh, something about what China is doing on clean, clean energy and clean technology. So I think uh, that can only be good for the world 
uh, it certainly should be a wake up call to all of us about what we need to be getting on with. So I, I think that's that's very real. On efficiency, um, I mean, Antoine may, and, and Brian have more detailed numbers, but you know, the, the testing we've done shows that, uh, that, that CO2, and it, it's somewhat a function of ambient conditions, because there are a lot of different conditions, and Mumbai in the summer is a little bit different than Boston today, um, that, uh, that CO2 refrigeration uh, will be more efficient than, than HFC 134A, which is the incumbent that we now use. And over time, as that technology matures and becomes you know, refined and optimized, it will become even more efficient. So we, we believe that there's a lot of opportunity there, not just in terms of the, the F gases and that Raj was very um, eloquent talking about the importance of both of those goals, right? That we need to get a, a, the F gas business, but we also need to focus on efficiency, net efficiency. And on uh, coolness, um, you know, there, there's some really exciting technologies yes, uh, out there. You know, solid state, cool on demand, um, uh, you know, and a whole host of venture capital um, um, uh, enterprises that are working on this. You know, Kleiner Perkins. And Thermal storage. All kinds of, of, of interesting things. So, you know, five, 10, 15 years from now, we could be having a very different conversation. Uh, the, the basic technology we're using today is, is you know, two centuries old. Raj? Yes, uh, I, will, I will answer the direct question which has been asked about uh, expanding the Montreal Protocol to include uh, other air gases, which I believe are uh, what he means is by which are there in the climate change, uh, in, the, in the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, to a certain extent, it is happening. This is a question of international laws and, uh, and uh, environmental treaties. Now, we have the other F gases, that is uh, SF6, EFCs, and, uh, and other gases, which are in the Kyoto Protocol, and it is being dominated by the debate in Kyoto. And now you have Montreal Protocol, where the gases are fixed, countries have agreed to it, and how you try to exchange it. Surprisingly, the lead has been taken by USA and they have already got an amendment which talks about getting the HFCs control, uh, controlling the emissions, the production of HFCs and the consumption of it in a Montreal protocol. But the question comes about the international treaties where you have one control substance in Kyoto Protocol, whether the other treaty, the international treaty can take up that substance for its debate. Now this is going to be the question, but I think the ways are being formed that just by taking some of the issues like HFCs, EFCs and SF6 in a Montreal Protocol doesn't mean that Kyoto Protocol doesn't have that substances. What is being done is the production and consumption of that is being considered as a control in the Montreal Protocol, whereas the emissions of that can be controlled under the Kyoto Protocol. So these two subtleties, as well as the complexities, are getting introduced. USA, Canada, and some of the uh, small island countries in Pacific, they have a proposals to control the HFCs under the Montreal Protocol. And as you know, the HFCs emissions are to be control controlled under the Kyoto Protocol. But these debates are going on, and they are very productive debates, as the United Nations Organization and many of the developing countries think about it. And, uh, it is thought that the solution will be formed and probably in a year or two the HFC's production and consumption will be controlled by the Montreal Protocol whereas the Kyoto Protocol will look at how to control the emissions which can be done more effectively than under production and consumption. Um, usually at the end of uh, an event one turns to somebody to give any concluding remarks and so and somebody who is insightful and articulate, which probably is not me. So, Helen, do you have anything to say? You know, Henry, I love that when you do that to me. <laughs> but um, I never, uh, never want to miss a moment where I can quote Thoreau because you know he says it better than anybody. So I'm going to rely on him again. And um, in the context uh, that this one is that you've been working on air policy and uh, in all of its many variants. And his quote is, if you have built castles in the air, your work need not be lost. There is where they should be. Just put foundations under them. So I would say congratulations to all of you for what you have done, and you have put foundations under them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.